bless you. Luke chapter 19, who take the word of God and go with me as we consider what the Lord is teaching us here in this passage of God's word. We refresh ourselves here in this chapter in Luke chapter 19, as we've read earlier this morning, verse 29, the Bible says, and it came to pass, and he, came, he was come nigh to Bethpage, and he is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, and Bethany, at the mount of the called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, into which at you entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never a man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, Why do ye loose him? Thus shall ye say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, unto the, they said, the Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat Jesus thereon. And as they went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. We'll stop our reading there this morning. We're looking at the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the last week of his earthly existence here in this physical body that he had as he came to earth, born of a virgin, and lived, went to the cross for our sakes, and then rose from the grave with. Thank God Jesus Christ came for our sakes, and here they're celebrating his entry in just a few days before he would go to the cross for our sins. It's amazing to think about the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ as he began this ministry. He, he, uh, as, as, he, as he became Messiah and declared himself to be so near the age of 30 years, uh, that people began to flock around him. There's a lot of excitement about his miracles. The uniqueness and the power of his preaching were so, were so uh, amazing to people. And, and as he continued in that ministry, he was thronged with crowds of people everywhere that he traveled. And as we get here now, we see this continuing to happen as he's moving into Jerusalem. Now, there's some separation going on there amongst people that truly believed and people that were fan just took a fancy with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's stop for a moment and realize this this morning as we consider that that's where this world is right now. We need to, we, we're praying that God will give an awakening to people to realize Jesus is the Son of God. He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. He is not just another great teacher. He's not a significant player on the world stage for historical sake. He is the Son of God, and you and I must trust him for our soul's salvation. We cannot be enamored with him hearing and answering our prayers beyond the truth, the fact that he is necessary for our eternal life. We, may not, we may not, must not enjoy the byproducts of relation with him or the, even the general grace that's poured out on this sin-filled earth. We cannot just enjoy that, acknowledge that without realizing we need him to deliver our soul from a devil's hell so that we can pass from death unto life. Many were enamored with the Lord Jesus Christ, and this passage shows us here there's a decision to make that we must understand who Jesus is and receive him in the fullness of who God says that he is according to God's word. Even in this group of people, he enters in with, with, with people thronging him. Amongst his own 12, there was a, one who would betray him. There were people that were following Jesus for all the wrong reasons. You and I this morning, if we're to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, we must follow him for the right reasons. Number one, I want you to notice his authority in this passage. Jesus demonstrates he's God, that he's necessary for eternity by showing his authority, his omniscience, his power, the proof of his deity over this situation. Verse 29, came to pass when he came nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village over against you, which is at your entering, you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never a man sat, loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. Jesus knew something his disciples did not know. Now, how, how many of us would confess this morning, Jesus knows a lot of things that you and I do not know. <laughs> he knows a lot of things. He knew you'd be here this morning. I, I didn't know some of you'd be here. I didn't know this beautiful family would be sitting up here this morning. I'm glad to see them, April and her family. And other folks are here, by the way. I'm sorry, they're so, they, they are first-rate guests this morning. We have a history with them. There are other guests here. We love you, too, but we're making a big deal out of them visiting with us today. 
And we're glad everybody's here, but we're excited about that. I, I didn't know they were going to be here. I, I'm glad to see that. And there are things that, we, that but I, I'm using that to demonstrate the fact there are things that the Lord knows that you and I do not know. And that's, that is a proof of the fact that he's God. His, God's foreknowledge is an important consideration in his deity. He was aware that a donkey existed in a certain place. He was aware that the, the donkey's owner would have a concern when someone would begin to take that donkey. But I'm listen, listen, I want you to know it's a comfort that for us as Christians to reflect upon the fact that the Lord knows all. He sees all. He's not surprised by anything. And you and I are, are surprised often with, diag with a diagnosis, with concerns, with cares of this life. And I and thank God that never surprises the Lord. He is prepared for every situation in your life. Did you know that? He's prepared. He was ready to walk into it with you. His preparation will, makes him able to provide for us, and then we're left to trust in him. That's a decision for you and I to make. If you believe he's the Lord, if you believe he's God, he's led you in a certain way, will you trust him with where he's leading you? Will you believe there's provision on the other side of this valley of challenge that you've entered into by God's decree and God's design? Do you believe that this morning? His foreknowledge proves his authority and deity. The fulfillment of prophecy, by the way. In the, in the Bible here, if you go, go back with me to the book of Zechariah in the Old Testament, we can have, it'll have a little Bible sword drill this morning to see who gets there. Uh, maybe you'd have to dust a few, a little bit of dust off the pages of the book of Zechariah in your Bible. We don't preach from it enough around here, but there's a prophetic expression here in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. And some of you just decided not to turn there. I'm praying for you this morning. That's okay. I'm going to read this verse to you. It's, in, it's there at the end of the Old Testament. And it says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly. Look here, riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. How about that? Hundreds of years before Jesus would come into, this, come into Jerusalem this way and make this decree to his disciples, it was already been prophet, prophetically decreed in the word of God. He would do this exact thing. He demonstrates his authority. He is the king. He is in charge. He is foreknowledge, the fulfillment of prophecy. He's aware of all that's going on. He knew that his time has come. He had been preparing for the cross. He was determined to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy concerning him and what he would do. And listen, this is abundantly clear that the Lord is in absolute control of the circumstances that would surround his own death on this earth. He laid down his life. No man took his life. He laid down his life for us. Notice, I want you to notice the authority that has. Do you recognize the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ in your own life? And it's one thing to read it. It's one thing to acknowledge it. But we must live it out practically day to day in our lives. That's a challenge. Uh, and someone mentioned, I think it was Pastor Ben Webster last night, mentioned this, this problem we have called practical atheism. We talk about God, then we live like he doesn't exist, and we, we make decisions like he has no part in them. God help us for that. We, his authority, I, I'm glad to know there's some people that do agree with him. I want to be in this group of people that agree with him and obey him. Look here what's, what's given to us as we move along. In verse number 32, it says, And they were sent, and they that were sent, there, uh, and they that were sent went their way. And he found even as he had said unto them. I'm glad to know these disciples obeyed him. Now, I don't know about you, but Jesus said, go do this, and there's going to be a donkey there, and, the, and you're going to tell the owner this. I'm like, are you sure about this? <laughs> are you sure about this? Do you really want me to do these kind of things? You know, as my children grow, it's interesting, their level of trust in their dad and their mom and things we tell them to do. Uh, there are certain things. Uh, I can give lots of personal examples. But yesterday, Nathaniel, I'll just give a personal example if you don't mind. But Nathaniel saw a vehicle he was interested in, a vehicle he was interested in. We're thinking about making some vehicle changes as he gets ready to go to college. The vehicle he has, he does not want to pay for the gasoline in when he's in college. Amen. So we're praying about that. He found this. And I just did not have time to go with him. Didn't have time to go with him. I said, look, you make the phone call. You say this to the person. And I know the person. You tell them who you are, by the way. I said, don't tell them you're Greg Gray's son. Tell them you're Danny Gray's grandson. Do that. <laughs> Do that. He said, what? I said, don't tell them you're Greg Gray's son. Tell them you're Danny Gray's grandson. I know who you're dealing with. You tell him, he'll know he better do right by you. <laughs> All right? He'll know that. He'll know that. He's our friend, but he'll know that. He, he likes me, but he, he respects Papa so much. He'll, even though Papa's not here, he'll still, he'll still do the right thing. Amen. He'll do that. 
And they said, I don't know about that. And, he, and uh, well, after, a while, after a while, it all took place. He called me and said, yeah, he said, that got his attention. It really got his attention. He said, Dad, I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. It sounds weird. Why do you want me? He said, just trust me on this. It worked out in his favor. We'll see if it works out in his favor. We haven't completed all that yet. But uh, I'm just saying, sometimes you, you doubt those that are in the charge, what they know and what they understand. You and I can be just like that with the Lord. Sometimes he tells us to do things that don't make sense, but he demonstrates his authority in all of it. He demonstrates who he is in all of it, and you and I are left to agree with him. <laughs> These disciples agree with him, and, and that they, he sent the disciples to bring this cult so he could enter Jerusalem and fulfill this. Listen, we all just do what the Lord tells us to do, even when it doesn't make sense, right? I'm glad the owners of the donkey were willing to cooperate. Uh, it's interesting here. They, they were sent. They went their way, verse 32. They found even they had said unto them, verse 33, excuse me. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners there have said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? As I would say it, why are you taking what belongs to me? Or maybe, maybe I would say, get your hands off that. It doesn't belong to you. I think that was probably the spirit that was in their heart at first. Would you agree? Yeah, don't do that. What are you doing? Uh, but they made this statement here. Or they said, the Lord hath need of them. And need of him. And you know what? And that settled it for the owners of that, the donkey right there. Why does the Lord need a donkey? Well, number one, the donkey belonged to Jesus. In the beginning, who created? God created the heavens and the earth. It's just a, a little lesson for us that anything that we have, maybe it seems really insignificant, still belongs to the Lord. And when he says, I need it, you and I can't judge the value of it, great or small. We just can only look to the owner of it. Though you and I have a stewardship, he owns it all. And so the great things in our life, maybe our, our, the people we love the most, I'm referring to my family, I, I think about them. They are, I would call them, if I could say, my greatest possessions. I don't know if that's the best way to express your family relationships, but they're my greatest value in life, I should say. They don't belong to me. They belong to the Lord. He says, if he says, I have need of them, they belong to him. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. If, they, if he has need of something else in my life that I don't even understand, I just say yes, Lord. And by the way, the disciples work together there. The people that are directing the donkey work together there to agree with the Lord. And even the donkey uh, obeyed the Lord. How about that? He went along with them. How many of us know that a donkey just doesn't do that by accident? You remember the Journey of Christmas event we had just a few weeks ago here? Uh, we we contract, contract with some folks to bring some live animals out here, and I enjoyed every night watching them bring the donkey in uh, to this major scene out there. It was a process, let me tell you. Now, I watched from afar. I want you to know that because I did not want to get mixed up into that. <laughs> I didn't want to mess up my good looks, as I like to say. I did not want to receive an injury from admiring that too closely. That donkey was stubborn. But here in this passage, we see an untamed, an unridden, an unproven donkey used by God to do something, maybe the greatest thing ever, have the Son of God ride into Jerusalem on his back. I thank God he can take some of the insignificant things of this world and make them significant. The little town of Bethlehem wouldn't be talked about very often if the Son of God hadn't been born there. Been thousands of years of tourism there. Why? Because Jesus Christ was born in that little out-of-the-way place. This little insignificant donkey, along with the disciples and the directors of this donkey, were, were, were just obeyed what the Lord said. And you and I should be willing to trust the God and the word of God and the precepts of God without hesitation in our life. We should be able to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord when it comes to the easy decisions and the difficult decisions of life. It's better to be on the side of God, the omniscient one, the one with all authority, to be in agreement with the Almighty as we think about him and comparison to this powerless world this morning as I preach about this great and mighty God may God help us to give him our undivided attention some of you have checked out this morning let me help you check back in he's watching you he's drawing you to himself while this preacher in a poor and pitiful way tries to remind you of that, God by his spirit is letting you know, I have something for you in your life. Will you go my way? And it's a remarkable thing that he would even give us a minute or a moment to think about it. What grace is this? What mercy? What love? Wake up. Excuse me. Wake up and think about the opportunity you have to do what God wants you to do. How about that? Sounds strong, doesn't it? 
We must follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he is Lord. Not just because of what he can do for us, by the way. God's way is, is the best way. But may God help us to follow the omniscient, the almighty one. Listen, now we close this morning with the fact that all this put a great ache in the Savior's heart. I'm making these declarations this morning, but I want you to see the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you continue with me here as we look here in this passage here? We look down and look at these words. And as he was come nigh, verse 37, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, as we continue here in Luke chapter 19, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And look here, and some of the Pharisees among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. These were the religious leaders. They didn't agree with the fact that Jesus was God. They did not recognize his authority. They were not in agreement with what he was preaching and teaching about himself. And they were not in agreement with those who were praising him and welcoming him into the holy city of Jerusalem. In verse number 40, he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Look here, the ache. I want you to see not just his authority, not just the agreement of those who acknowledge his authority, but the ache in the Savior heart, Savior's heart. I want you to know Jesus is concerned about you. Jesus is concerned. He's not worried, but he wants you. He, he's, he's a weeping Savior. He's not, a, he's, not, he's not a general. <laughs> he, he's, not a de, he's not a demander. He's not a dictator. He's a weeping savior. This is who he is. This, this is who he is. And we see that in his heart. Even as he is being reviled, right here, the Pharisees look at him and said, tell them you're not God. Tell them that you're not who they say you are. You better tell them right now. They were saying, we don't believe it, and you better do something about it here. There's an ache here. All this reasoning, there's a lot of reasoning going on in people's heart and minds. I want you to notice that for just a moment. Again, in Jesus' day, a king would enter into a land and make, to make peace by riding on a donkey. There was some, some tradition of that in the political and the governmental processes here. Of course, we know it according to Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. The prince of peace was entering into Jerusalem. He would bring, bring peace through the blood of his cross. Jesus' disciples, again, would place their coats, uh, their, coats their, their jackets there, their, 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 their overcoats there on the coat as a saddle and then place Jesus upon that coat and they would bring him in. Again, they were welcoming Jesus to be their king. That's what's taking place here in Luke chapter 19. We see it in Matthew 21. We see it in Mark chapter 11, John chapter 11. Also, as we think about the, the, the synoptic gospels, even what's given there in the book of John, the Passover celebration is getting ready to take place, commemorating God's people of ancient times coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea, a beautiful picture of salvation that's still remembered to this day amongst God's people. All these things are converging. They're coming together. Jesus is coming in. There's every reason to know and to understand according to Zechariah, according to Isaiah, according to the fulfillment of prophecy and all that Jesus is demonstrating that he is the Messiah. He's saying, here I am. Will you receive me? <laughs> He's doing it in word and in deed. In word and in deed. He is saying, I am the one promised by God himself who would come and crush the serpent's head. I am him. I meet all these, all, all the requirements. Check, take the list out, the manifest out. Check the list all the way down the list. He meets them all. He's fulfilling the prophecy in word and in deed. He's here. He's riding in. Many people are acknowledging this. Some people following from afar. Some people enamored by his miracles. Let's see what takes place here. I want you to notice the reception of the Savior here. They experienced such excitement as they were, they were crying out here, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're, they're excited about all of it. They were rejoicing in the mighty works that he has done that many of them were not acknowledging him as Messiah. There was, a, there was so much excitement about Jesus the man. There was excitement in verse 37 about Jesus the messenger. They'd received some enlightenment from him. Look here, verse 37, when he's come nigh, and even now in the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. They had seen miracles. They had, they had, they had, uh, they had heard a message 
They, they were enamored with these things, but not received him as the Messiah, as we think about here. And look here at verse number 38 again. Blessed is the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Again, a day we commemorate like today as Palm Sunday some 2,000 years ago. Jesus triumphantly comes in for his disciples. A, a day of great excitement, great joy. But for the Lord, we see a day of heartache and disappointment. You know why? Because he was refused by so many. He was refused by religious leadership. I mean, as a man who would have called himself a pastor like myself, too many of them in that day would have said, he does not fit the bill. I won't take him. I won't receive him. Imagine that someone who claims to be a man of God rejecting the son of God. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't think it's news to you. There are many people that claim to be a man of God who reject the actual son of God in this current day. You ought, you ought to ask for the discernment of the Holy Spirit of God about understanding who is a follower of God and who isn't. And just because someone puts on a, a, a suit and tie and stands behind a pulpit of wood like this and opens up a Bible, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all in on what God says. It's easy to criticize those who have the medium of television or the Internet or, or the radio. It's easy to do that because they're so public. But I tell you what, there's, if we can find them in a public way, we can find them in lots of places around the world. Who are, who are espousing something, they don't even believe. God help us not to be just talk about it, but to believe he's the son of God. We see a refusal here in verse 39, and some of the Pharisees among, among the multitude said unto him, Master, they're calling him a teacher. They're not acknowledging him as the Messiah. Rebuke thy disciples here. They refuse to see the truth that Jesus was fulfilling all the Old Testament. You and I sit on this side of it in the Lord's house worshiping him on a Sunday morning. We don't understand how in the world they could come to this conclusion. But they're blinded because they refuse to believe. They considered him to be an imposter. They considered him to be an instigator. They considered him to be an intruder into their system, into their way of life. He had, he had interrupted a good thing that they had going on, and he, they were not willing to accept him. And whether you know it or not, Jesus is on trial in your heart today. That's exactly what's going on. In essence, he, he was on trial in their lives. We'll see the fulfillment of that as he goes. Jesus would go before Pilate. I want you to know, you can't have it both ways when it comes to your eternal life. You can't just you can't have some acknowledgement of Jesus without truly accepting who he is. You're either accepting him or refusing him. You're either in obedience to him or a disobedience to him. Here, Jesus here, it says here, they say rebuke them, and Jesus refuses to rebuke his disciples. He tells them that if they don't give him praise, that the rocks are going to cry out. How about that? Be ashamed to think that, that nature cries out that, that there is a God and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I, I remember reading one commentator, one, one, one rather renowned commentator, he said, this just proves that those Pharisees are dumber than a rock. <laughs> if we want to acknowledge that Jesus is God, that he has saved us from our sins, my friends, that is foolish. In fact, the Bible reminds us this, the fool has said in their heart, there is no God. That's what the fool says. Now, if you and I say there is a God, it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to live it. You say he has authority if you call him God. Are you in agreement with his authority? I mean, is he going to, you're going to let him guide and lead your life, or you're still going to make all your own decisions? Absent of his, his desires and his will. I'll tell you what, he's concerned about you. He, he's, he's not upset with you. He's not, he's not upset. He's sobbing. Look, verse 41. And when he was come near, he held the city and he beheld it and wept over it. This word wept is a sobbing word. You ever seen when someone brokenhearted, they cry uncontrollably? We often associate it with grief, the loss, the death of a loved one. If you've walked through the valley of grief, you know what it's like to have, have sobs sneak up on you unexpectedly in the most unusual moments. I tell you, Jesus was grieving in his spirit and his heart right here. It's remarkable. It says, and he, he wept, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, and the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. I want you to understand this. Jesus was not hid, hidden, hiding these things from their eyes. He was exposing himself, revealing himself. He was saying and doing the things that the Messiah would do for them to have the opportunity to receive and accept, but their rejection blinded them. They were blinded by their own refusal to accept him. 
That's where they were in this moment. Uh, that Jesus looked at Jerusalem and wept because they were destroying themselves. We see the sobbing Savior here. He's bursting into tears. He's weeping out loud. His chest is heaving. His shoulders are moving. Tears are streaming down his, his face as he thinks about the future of this beloved people that he has come to give himself for. It was that same heart that would cause our Savior to say in just a few days, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. What mercy and grace. It's unfathomable how deep God's forgiveness is mercy and grace goes. No matter where Jesus looked, one commentator said, he found cause for weeping. If he looked back, he saw a nation had wasted opportunities. If he looked within, he saw the spiritual ignorance and blindness. As he looked around, he saw religious activity that really didn't accomplish much at all. As he looked ahead, he wept as he saw the judgment that was coming to the nation and the city and the temple. As in just a few years, it would be destroyed and again, he wonders, uh, we wonder now, how much is he weeping in this day for the things that are happening in our lives and will happen in our country if we continue to ignore him? He's sobbing over our situation as we continue in unbelief. He is sore with an ache in his heart, weeping over us. That's how the Lord sees it. He rejoices not in the judgment that awaits those who reject him, but we do see that judgment in the sovereignty of the Savior in verses 42, 43, and 44, saying, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. I, I could preach forever about this. Excuse me. I, I know we, we cannot be here all day, but have you ever considered all the benefits of eternal salvation? I mean, you're enjoying them right now. If you know the Lord, you're going to enjoy them forever. He says, the things that you're going to get, all the things you get when you get Jesus, if I could say it that way. <laughs> Everything you get, it's unbelievable. He, he's saying, would you not realize that? Would that not be revealed unto you? Would not be awakened to that? If you're rejecting the Lord and his life uh, that, that he has for you, I want you to know you're rejecting every good thing that God has chosen for you. It's not just good, it's the best it could ever be. If thou hast known, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Look, for the days shall come upon thy, on thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee around and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. Jerusalem is rejecting Messiah. They don't know the destruction is right around the corner. Literally, historically from them, Titus, a Roman general, would come in and level the place. Level the temple. You say, he's not going to touch the temple. He destroyed it. Destroyed it. This ungodly man was used by God to destroy that temple. You know why? That temple was no good because they weren't worshiping the true God there. No good. It was destroyed. It was destroyed. All that was happening. But I want you to know it's a picture to the fact that you and I await eternal damnation if we continue to reject the Savior. He knew that there, was, there were tough days coming for Jerusalem in the immediate, but also in the eternal. And a willful ignorance of the truth of God always leads to judgment from God. But I want you to know, Christ is not happy about this. He's brokenhearted over this, and the, and the sobbing Savior seeks your soul today. The sobbing Savior desires great that you and I would know who he is and we would receive him in the fullness of that truth by the help of the Holy Ghost and realize that we're a sinner lost and bound to hell without any hope, but that he came and died on the cross and made a way for us to have eternal life. If we'll come by the way of the cross in the empty tomb, if we'll pray and, and ask him to forgive us and repent and turn from our sin to the Savior, we can have all that God wants for us. We can have God himself who loves us with an everlasting love. As the people watched Jesus ride on the back of that donkey, covered with the coats of his disciples and on into Jerusalem that day, and, and people were shouting and singing, and there's the idea of the palms and then these things being used in other books of the Bible here that show us these things. Some people were looking, but they weren't really seeing what was going on. I'm afraid too many people sit in churches like this and they're looking, but they really don't know what's going on. I'm not trying to condemn anyone, but I am trying to rescue anybody I can by God's grace. We're looking, but we're not seeing what's going on. Uh, there was a radio program, The American Life, that told the story of a, of a writer named David Rakoff. 
It's kind of goofy. He said he, he had a hard time believing what was right in front of his eyes. In 1986, he, he had a company in Tokyo was working on a computer program that would allow people like himself to write short little messages to one another after logging onto a network. He was not impressed. He thought, what kind of loser would log onto a computer just to talk to somebody? <laughs> I guess I'm a loser. I, I don't know. In a moment of decisiveness, he went, he, he went into to his work there and just quit all that. And he said this, sayonara, suckers. Good luck with your network. <laughs> well, that network turned into the Internet. He, couldn't, he was looking at something, but he could not see what was there. I'll tell you, a lot of people saw Jesus coming in on the back of that donkey. And I'll tell you what, he's coming in. Zechariah had prophesied it. He's coming in, being received as not just a king, but the king, the king. Blessed be the king, the king. He's the only king. Some people understood that. Many people rejected that. They were telling other people, tell them, to, tell them to shut their mouths. But you and I, ought to, uh, by God's grace and the help of the Holy Spirit, understand he's, the, he's revealed to us as the son of God, the savior of the world, the way, the truth, and the life. And no man, including you comes unto the Father, but by him. Including me. Including those in the halls of power and the palaces of wealth or in the places of rejection and, and outcasts in this world. No one comes to him but through Jesus Christ. I'm glad that we can. I'm glad that we can. Today we ought to decide to do what Jesus tells us to do based on this passage. We ought to decide to give Jesus what, what he tells us to give. And we ought to, God help us to feel what Jesus feels. It's easy to walk around condemning people, isn't it? There are segments of this society that I, I'm too willing to condemn, but Jesus sobs over them. He sobs over them. But God help us, all of us to receive exactly what Jesus offers. He's not offering you a better life. He's offering you eternal life. And you can't have it unless you accept him as the blessed son of God. Would you receive him today? And if you have, will you go his way and do what he said to do? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Thank you for your attention this morning. May God help us as we consider his truth. Can you say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord? You need the help of the Holy Ghost, the help of the Holy Spirit who reveals that truth to us to enlighten you. But will you receive him today? In just a moment, we'll, we'll ask you to stand and we'll sing a hymn of invitation. I, I encourage you to respond to this truth. If you've not prayed and asked Jesus into your heart uh, because you know you're a sinner and you're bound to a devil's hell without him, if you, if you haven't done that, let's do that today. Let's do that today. Let's get it settled today. You can settle it once for all, just like Jesus died once for all. You don't have to keep begging God to save you. If you ask him once, in sincerity, if I could use that word, he will do what he said he will do. And eternal life is eternal. It lasts forever. <laughs> Only you know if you've asked for it and received it. I don't want to cause you to doubt today, but stop, stop looking at him for any other reason, at Jesus that is, but your eternal life. Certainly not just a good teacher. He's your only hope. They begin to play this hymn of invitation. Will you receive the Lord as your Savior today? You can do that by coming... To forward in just a moment where our heads are bowed and eyes are closed you can receive him and, so, and Christians if we really believe this God help us not to be practical atheists amen he has all authority when he asks for anything I don't care how big or how small it is it's his yes my life is his my family is his my everything is his don't, let's not just say it, let's live it. Would you stand with me, please? We'll begin to sing hymn 294, just a verse or two as God moves. There's room in this altar to come to the Lord. There's room on these front pews. You can't kneel. God help us. God has smitten my heart with this truth. I think too often I am a practical atheist. I say one thing and live another way. All my anxiety shows a different person all my fears all my
all my selfishness, portray somebody different than what I say I am too often. I'm glad it'll take me just like that. Just as I am, we're going to sing it. 294 if you need the hymn book. Brother Caleb, if you'll lead us, please. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Folks are responding. Please take this opportunity to be right with God. We want to help you if you allow us. One more verse together. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to humbled by the truth of who you are and the expressions of your care and love for us. Your tears over those that reject you are so, are so moving, so powerful, they're so revealing about who you are and how you think of us and how you, what you want for our lives. God, I pray would no one would reject your expressions of love. It's easy to fall in love with this life and fall in love with our own ideas and and to trust ourselves and have a hard time trusting a God we cannot see. But I ask you to continue to reveal yourself to us through the, this world and through other people, through certainly through the Word of God and the Spirit of God, so that people would have a, have a true, true understanding of who you are and what you want for us. You're not here to, certainly not here to harm us. And I pray all in the sound of my voice would leave here as right with God as they know how to be. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. What a wonderful opportunity we have.